worship for July 5th. As you know, churches in the country are now legally allowed to be open. Many churches are not open this Sunday, ours included, and some are doing dry runs and others are opening with full enthusiasm. Both of our churches have decided that now is not the time to open, that it will take us some time and some real thinking about how we can make our churches safe for all those who will want to attend and how we can meet all the different guidances, but also how, for how it can be a meaningful experience for those who come. So we'll be continuing our recorded services and Zoom services for the unforeseeable future and to make sure that um, we're able to gather together in some way, even if it's not behind the door doors of our churches. So I'm glad to have you here, glad that we can worship together wherever we are and that we can share in God's presence and God's word together and be blessed by it and hopefully be able to bless one another through it. Let's make a beginning then. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts, and triumph over the shades of night. Blessed are you, creator of all, to you be praise and glory forever. As your dawn renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation, may we rejoice in the day you have made, as we wake refreshed from the depths of sleep. Open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My God shall make my darkness to be bright the light and peace of Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. You have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth and Christ shall give you light. When Christ our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, If I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members." Wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin.
At first glance in our reading from Romans, Paul sounds like he thinks that he's a failure beyond redemption. He desires to do the right thing, but his body doesn't go along with it. He still sticks with some of the desires that he had before he became a Christian, and he despairs at what a mess he is. He tries the right things, but he can't get his whole self to follow through with them. Now, it would be easy to think that he's settling there and calling himself a failure and telling us that there's no point trying this if it wasn't for this great verse in the midst of it. But thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows that without Christ, without the cross, we will fail. Without God's grace, his willingness to let us stumble and fall and to get up and try again, we'd fail. There'd be no point trying to live the godly life and living the life that Christ leads us into if all we're capable of doing is digging a hole deeper. This passage is written from someone who, by someone who's discovered that God doesn't give up on us even if we are a mess. As we keep trying to be obedient and to follow in the way of Christ, God doesn't let us down. In fact, Paul, I think, sees his failures as a positive thing only in the sense that he's at least trying to be obedient. He's not failing in disobedience. He's not failing because he's turned away. He's failing because he's trying something he doesn't know how to do. Now, in this passage, Paul writes an awful lot about the clash of desires. A desire to do what God calls me to do, but all the desires of my heart call me to do something else, and my body decides to go and follow other appetites. It's a well-known thing that, as people, we tend to shape ourselves towards what we desire. We give our lives over to what we want to be and what we want to achieve. And so learning a new desire means learning a new way to shape ourselves, a new life to give ourselves over to. And it's a difficult one because the call of God is to desire what's different than what the world calls us to desire. The call of God is to desire mercy and peace and love and joy and humility and gentleness and self-control and kindness. We live our lives for other people so that they may know the goodness of God as well. We live like Jesus did, giving our lives so that others might live too. We don't do it to score points or to earn a place in heaven. We do it because it makes us more like Christ. And the more like Christ we become, the more truly human, the more truly created that we are, we become. The important thing about this new desire is that it becomes embedded in every aspect of our lives. It becomes part of the fiber of everything that we do when we wake up and set our agendas. This desire to please God in being like Christ is at the forefront. These are new desires to us and we have to practice them just like you have to practice anything else. We have to learn how to do these new things so that we can be proficient at them, be really good at them, but sometimes just to be okay at them and to see where we need to improve and to learn that improvement so that we grow. As I thought about how I might demonstrate this, I thought it's an awful lot like learning how to juggle. I learned how to juggle at university. I used to be okay at it. Now I'm absolutely rubbish and had to do lots of practicing for this sermon, letting the basics come back to me. But let me show you how through each step of learning how to juggle can show us what it's like to follow these new desires and what it takes to develop them into a life that's more like Christ and less like the world. The first thing you do when you're learning how to juggle is you toss one ball in the air over and over, just getting used to the rhythm of a ball going into the air and catching it in your hand. It doesn't look very hard, and it's actually quite easy, and you can pay attention to other things. You can do it in front of the television, you can talk to other people, because it doesn't take a lot to be able to do this bit. It's a building block to what you'll do later on. 
But then you add a second ball and as you can see, I'm already slightly confused when I begin to do this. You have to focus on the two, just throwing them up and down. I'm not even sw swapping hands or doing anything complicated, but you have to pay more attention. You have to focus. You need to have your hands working together, your eyes working with your hands and your mind knowing what it wants to achieve as it tosses those balls around. Where it gets tricky is when you add the third ball because you need to keep one of those balls in the air all the time. As it's coming to land in your hand, the other one has to be launching out of your hand, making them go around in a circle of some kind. You really need to focus on this. You really need to have everything in your whole self working together. You need to desire to keep those balls in the air. So you practice and you practice and it can make your legs hurt from bending over and picking the balls up that you've dropped. But the more you practice, the less you find yourself dropping them. Now it gets even more difficult if you want to toss one over your back or under your leg, which I can't do because I haven't desired it enough to put the work into learning how to do that and perfecting it. And as you can see from my juggling right here, I still have a way to go. Life is more complex than learning how to juggle bean bags. Faith is more than just trying to really hard, trying really hard and trying to become disciplined. Without Christ, we'd be lost and smothered by sin and the constant struggle and failure to try to attain a freedom that we don't really have the capacity to attain ourselves. God wins our victory on the cross. And the desires that lead to sin and death can be left behind there while we replace them with the desires and living that lead to life. If our desires can't be attained without sin, then they aren't godly desires. If our desires lead us to sin, they aren't godly. And like breaking free from anything or any activity that holds us captive, we have to acknowledge that we have a problem in the first place and that we need help. And that's what Paul is putting in writing here in this passage from Romans. He's declaring that he does not have sin under control, even though he follows Christ. He's acknowledging that he has a long way to go before he can say that he is in the likeness of Christ. But rather than despairing, he says, my joy is in desiring and attempting to live the life that Christ has given me and to live in Christ. Thanks be to God who has given us Jesus Christ to overcome what we can't overcome or control ourselves. It is not just down to us to get us out of this. Christ comes and extends his hand to us and teaches us how to leave and how to stay out of the mess we find ourselves in. So Paul invites each one of us to look at our own struggles and to see hope in the cross and to relieve ourselves of the burden of trying to be the victors or the defeated. But instead, he calls us to live as genuinely human people as far as we can. We focus on being the people God has created us to be and that he calls us to be. And Paul reminds us through this passage that we don't do this alone. Instead, we do it with the help of all of heaven if we want all of heaven to help us. Amen. We come to a time of prayer now. The song that we're using as our underlying music is a song that we used early in the lockdown to remind us of our sad hearts, our crying out to God in lament for all of the loss that we were experiencing, the disorientation, the sadness of being shut off from the world and from loved ones. But let's continue praying as we come towards this easing of the lockdown when we have more freedom and hopefully more chance to be part of the wider world safely. But let's not forget to pray for those who care for us, for those who love us, for those who have responsibility over us and for our own responsibility in the world. Let's continue to pray for those who are sick and those who care for them and also for those who have been bereaved during this time, for those who have found this a very difficult time in terms of mental health, for those people who have been lonely, for those people 
who will struggle coming out of this time to be secure and safe, whether it's health-wise or economically. So let's offer to God during this time what's on our hearts as we also listen to these words of crying out to God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 
As our prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and to set us free to sing your praise, now and forever. Amen. It's been great to worship with you this morning, and we look forward to the time when we can do that face to face and in person to, with one another. So I hope that you have a blessed day today. Hopefully it will be sunshiny for you, whether you're going out today. And if you are, go and be safe. But if you're deciding you're just going to stay home and stick to home pleasures, I hope that's a good time for you as well. Don't forget that next week we're saying goodbye to Paul Pritchard. It's his final service and there'll be a pre-recorded service at 10 o'clock on YouTube. That's when it will be published. And then fairly soon after, around 10.30, we're going to have a big Zoom gathering, which you will have hopefully received a, an invitation um, through email for. So we hope that you can join us then and say farewell to Paul and listen to him say farewell to us as they go off to their new ministry in Wales. So be blessed in all that you do today, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye.